Today's episode is sponsored by the Idea Farm, my own private curated research service that gives investors access to research reports often used by the world's largest institutions, funds, and money managers. We also curate our favorite investing podcasts each week. Last month, we shared episodes on bourbon as an investment, Moderna's CFO on the financial side of developing and distributing the vaccine, and how shrinkflation is starting to appear. Best of all, as soon as you sign up, you'll be sent the most recent quarterly valuation update, which we send out every quarter, along with our Quant Excel backtester. If you sign up right now and decided it's not for you, no big deal. You can cancel within the first 30 days and get a full refund. That's right, no risks. So go to theideafarm.com and sign up today. Jim, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Meb. How are you? I'm great. I was actually going to do the Infinite Loops intro. I feel like I have it entirely memorized at this point. Welcome to Infinite Loops. This is your host, and I can do almost like... Well, hello, everybody. (laughs) There you go. But wait, I'm on the Meb show. That's right. Well, I was going to save you to episode 500 and try to have, you know, you be the nice round number, but... You're either impatient or really bad at keeping secrets. I'm not sure which it is, but you have all this uh, new exciting news that slowly started to trickle out over the last few minutes. Can you keep a secret or what? Like, is this like Christmas morning? You just opened the presents the night before. What's the story? I can keep a secret. I've been a fiduciary or was for 35 years. So, oh, man, the stuff I could tell you, but it's locked under the cone of silence. But as far as leaking information out, I'm impossible. Like if something's really exciting, I can't help myself. And so all the leaks come from the top. (laughs) You've had this, you know, saddle of other people's money, your like whole life. And now you're finally done with that burden. I mean, what does it feel like? You can light your own money on fire now. Exactly, exactly. I, it's only fair. And as you know, I'm a big uh, skin in the da- game type of guy. So in all seriousness, listen, you can't be, as you know, you can't be a fiduciary for a long period of time and then suddenly flip a switch and turn that off. So there's no question that it still really guides a lot of my thinking, even with what we're doing at O'Shaughnessy Ventures. But honestly, I think it was good training, right? Because it tempers enthusiasm. It makes you seek out information which is contrary to your thesis. You really get trained in trying to figure out. It's like I used to say, all stocks should be considered guilty until proven innocent, right? And kind of the same thing here. You want to look for, I'm very enthusiastic about what we're doing, obviously, I wouldn't be doing it, but you also want to be aware and cognizant of the things that can go kablooey, because they do, and usually at the worst possible time. In that regard, Murphy was an optimist. Last time we chatted, I was like, well, maybe Jim's going to take a little sabbatical, I don't know, play golf in Florida, at least take a little downtime, but it wasn't even like skip a beat, man. So for the listeners, you can kind of correct me here, but I kind of put your, from what I know, your career, maybe like three main acts, right? There's the young Jim, incredible hair, taking over Wall Street, publishing books, going on Oprah, and then starting an internet company right at the peak of the bubble, selling that company, then doing your next version of O'Shaughnessy, selling that company, and now this third act. But maybe there's an earlier origin story. You want to give us a little bit of like this third piece? What was the inspiration for this, man? So it sounds very woo-woo, but I've always kind of believed that you can write your life into existence in a way of speaking. And that's exactly what I've done. If you're watching this, I, do you release in video as well, or do you just do? Yeah, as long as you and I don't embarrass ourselves, we, we'll we put it on YouTube. Like I'm surrounded by nearly 100 journals in which I started keeping when I was 18. And I kind of thought of my life that way, like a play in 4X. And I admire your intuition to say Act 3 because that's what this is. 
I started thinking about this, you know, a long, long time ago. As a fellow quant, you will immediately understand one of the things that we face as quants, right, is our data sets are virtually identical, right? We're all using pretty much the same clean data sets to run our tests on, et cetera. And one of the things that I really was interested in as machine learning and AI started to come online was I was thinking, and my thesis was there is a lot of data that gets discarded from the traditional quant methodology. And I thought, you know, kind of thinking along the lines of Claude Shannon's information theory, that information, to be real information, it has to be something new, yeah? I think he joked that a political speech carries zero information, whereas a poem is filled with information. And so I really wanted to figure out a way, how could I do that kind of research within a company, et cetera? Well, that led to a bunch of other things that I always wanted to do, and obviously couldn't do because I was running O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. So it was kind of like, I don't know, maybe a seven-year build as I started writing out, you know, uh, for Act 3, here's what I'd really like to focus on. And pretty much you'll see it if you go to osv.llc. The verticals that are there are the beginning. There'll be others, but th those are the ones that I really wanted to focus on because, A, they're going to be a lot of fun, which is something that I kind of insist upon. I want to really be animated by what I'm doing. But they're also, these have been things that I have been fascinated by for years. Cool. I mean, pretty soon you're going to run out of O'Shaughnessy variations of the name. You had, what was the O'Shaughnessy Capital was the first or no? O'Shaughnessy O'Shaughnessy Capital Management was the first. I'll tell you the story about that. So when I formed that in 1987, 88, everything was in meat space, right? So literally the brochure for that took, I don't know, six months. And I actually went to a marble uh, quarry to take pictures of what I wanted to be on the cover of it. And then you had to hire a design shop to do it, and you went back and forth, and it took forever. But when I was trying to name it, my wife and I were talking, and she's like, what are your potential names? And I started listing off some of the names. And, you know, honestly, most of them were horrible. You know, think whatever we thought was cool way back in 88 or 87, and those were a lot of the names. And she looks at me, and she goes, Chip. What did every major financial house on Wall Street, the big ones, when they were formed all that time ago, what, what were they named? And I went, well, they were named after the partners. She goes, and why was that? And I said, well, because they had to demonstrate that not only was their own money on the line, their reputation, their name was on the line. And she goes, I think you just answered what you have to call your company. <laughs> and I'm like, I love it because, as you know, I'm a burn the ships kind of guy. I go all in on everything I do. And so putting my name on it puts me at risk in terms of reputation, in terms of all of those things. And it focuses the mind. Yeah. Well, I like it. We're somewhat running into an issue <laughs> recently with my company name, which actually preceded me. But there's like three or four variants and so we just moved in this new office in Manhattan Beach. You have to come see us next time in LA, down by the water, take you surfing. We'll take you out for a meal or a beverage. But we put up sign, you know, Cambria or whatever. And people kept coming by and they said, Cambria, the hotel company. And I said, well, no. They said, Cambria, the granite tabletop company. Because we had mold wine. It was like a holiday thing. We had mold wine and cider with whiskey if you wanted it. And they kept coming by. And I said, I don't, the bad part is that nobody knows who we are. The good part is we get free advertising from these other companies. So they get the name behind the sports. One of them is a very heavy advertiser, but nobody knows what they do. So we considered it. But it makes sense to go the route you did. All right. So O'Shaughnessy, hard to spell, but easy to remember. Sold one, sold two. And here we are now with this new vision. 
you want to you want to give us the reveal tell tell the listeners what jim's got in store because it's a lot man so the reveal is that i have for quite some time been thinking that kind of all the old ways of doing things were or are collapsing old models for business that used to work no longer work because of innovations and advances in technology and whatnot and so i started thinking about it and named it the great reshuffle where we are kind of at an inflection point where everything is changing rapidly and people are having some people are having a hard time tuning in to those changes. Bucky Fuller had a very charitable way of talking about people who like hate the new, right? And and he said it isn't so much that they hate the new, it's that they're just not tuned into it yet, right? And he gave some examples, the the best of which was you know, before we invented microscopes, we had no idea that there was an entire different world down there. And But even after we got the first microscope, right, and looked at it, holy shit, what the hell is that, right? It took us a long time, 200 years, as a society in general to tune in to that. And so then along came COVID. And a lot of the trends that I had kind of listed as probably unfolding over like a seven to a 10 year period got collapsed down into a couple of years because of the lockdown and because of all the changes that it required. And so the the thesis is that we are kind of at an inflection point, not just in tech, for example, with AI and things like that, but in the emergence of a true sort of meritocracy of ability to join networks. I always talk about Twitter as being kind of the first global intelligence network, or it could become, right? No matter who owns it, it's installed base. Or in spite of who owns it, I don't know. Which. Right, exactly. In <laughs> spite, of, Well, right, yeah. In spite of who owns it, or is running it, it seems to have become a schnelling point for really clever, bright people. And it became very obvious during lockdown that people could work from anywhere. They didn't have to commute an hour to an office to sit in a cubicle and, you know, barely even look at the guy or woman next to them. So, in fact, our experience at OSAM was people became more efficient in their work. But, you know, we, because I thought that that was a trend, we put, we duplicated everyone's workstation at their home. So when, uh, like back in 2015, so we didn't miss a beat. But as I watched it unfold and I, as I watched and talked to people, right? Like I talked to one guy and he goes, what the fuck am I doing in an airplane you know, for 10,000 hours a year when it's almost as efficient to do Zooms and or other ways of communicating, which led me to kind of conclude I got my timing wrong. Uh, it's all happening now. And I think that we're going to see a continuation. I really think that, like, I'm incredibly bullish on what's happening because time, space, geography have all collapsed. It really doesn't matter where you are physically anymore. It doesn't matter. You can change your digital zip code really easily. It's very hard if you're in the middle of nowhere and you want to talk quantum physics with somebody, right? And all your neighbors are like talking about bingo or whatever. It's going to be hard to find a satisfying conversant now. Uh, we have the entire globe and it has shrunk down to a point where I believe that because networks are going to be more loose, i.e. old networks, right? Like the old boys club, right? Or old girls club. It depended on where you went to school. It depended on, you know, what neighborhood you lived in, what your social class was, all of those things. I think that's all gone. And one of the things you're going to be able to see is much 
greater cognitive diversity and the allowance of letting people who are who've got great ideas into a looser network. And right now, as we're talking, that is actually happening. Well, it's funny, you know, your most popular tweet, do you know what it is, by the way? No. So your most popular tweet, which is on a network social website or app. By the way, I deleted Twitter app off my phone during the holidays because my wife was in my ear about it. But the problem is you can still access it from a browser. So I need a separate hack to be able to take a little, because only Twitter may be on my desktop. Anyway, so your most favorited tweet, I think it was during the pandemic, but you were talking about how people can access, I mean, this hits all your themes, by the way, a lot of the free online coursework from many of the top universities. And I just re-downloaded it today. I was looking at all his courses and I was like, oh man, there's like 20 on here I want to take. I totally forgot about it. But it's such a good example of kind of what you're talking about. All right, keep going. I don't pay attention to like most of the metrics on Twitter. I think number of followers, for example, is a vanity metric and is meaningless because, you know, if you've got 100,000 followers and 95,000 of them are bots, it's not going to help you. Or you work in quantitative finance and 98% are male. <laughs> right. This is the world we chose, Jim. It just I is know, our reality. Maybe I it's know. 93% for you, but for me, it's like 98%. So, so be it. But that point that that being one of my most favorite tweets, I think it really illustrates what I'm talking about, right? The internet is taking away all of your excuses. And by that, I mean, you can get a first class education for free, right? Look at what Patrick's building with Colossus. That is going to, a few years from now, be able to give you a better education than an MBA at a reasonably good college, I think. And we're only going to see more of that, not less. And in a digital world, this abundance of resources becomes everyone's, everyone can access it. Everyone can take all of those courses for free. Everyone can listen to Patrick or your podcast or mine for free, right? Now, there are some that charge fine, but the amount that are absolutely free, nothing barring you from finding that material is endless. It's literally endless. And it's only going to get more expansive. And so I think that this affects like virtually everything. It affects how we educate kids today, I think, is really a, so archaic and based on an agrarian country or one going into industrialization, right? That is the world anymore. And there are schools like Synthesis School, for example, I'm very interested in them, where they teach kids how to think rather than what to think. And so, like, if you and I wanted to, we could spitball it, go back and forth, iterate, iterate, and we could probably come up with, I would bet, like, an amazing year-long course all online, and at the end of it, the person would be as proficient in quant as you and I are. And, like, to me, that's amazing. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, it seems like, and you're an optimist. I like to consider myself a the world's biggest optimist on the inside. I don't come across that way on Twitter often, but at my core, I get excited. Palms are sweaty. Just thinking about the things you're talking about. It's limitless possibility for, as you said, like just if you want to go out and, and just grasp it. So you're at this point now, you kind of say, okay, this we're at this confluence in time. I'm not just going to take a sabbatical and write another book, although you might. What are you up to, four now, five? Four. Okay. But I'm going to start to think about all these things in my head. Let's open the curtains a little bit. Tell us a little bit about this new ventures that you're birthing into reality. Sure. So let's talk about the, the one I'm probably best known for, which is investing. We started doing private market investing through our family office in probably 2006. 
or probably seven, and it accelerated when we had the global financial crisis. And I was thinking, gosh, my largest asset is tied to global long equities. Hmm, I might want to diversify a little bit. So I love investing in private companies uh, all the way from the getting started seed stage through an A or a B round and have been doing it since then. And so we thought, okay, well, let's make it official and get a broader reach. So we call that all of our verticals are named infinite because of infinite loops, right? So infinite adventures. And we say adventures because that was the original term for venture capital, right? When the guys were, they called them the the traitorous eight, And it was a bunch of engineers who worked for Shockley to build transistors. And apparently he was not a great guy, right? He was a micromanager, you know, uh, very, very into himself, shocking, and wanted to take credit for everything. And, And the team wanted to continue as a team, but they wanted to leave. And they went looking for a company to hire them and Along came a guy, I can't remember his name, but he's like, well, why don't you just start your own company? And this is what's fascinating to me. This is the late 1950s. The thought of starting their own company did not even occur to them because that was the era of the big companies ran everything. We had big company, big government, big labor, et cetera. And the guy said, I'll fund you. It'll be an adventure, right? And so... Thus was born venture capital. But there's a second name that I like even more, which is liberation capital. That's what they used to call it. And I love that term because one of the other things that's changing in this great reshuffle is this idea of, you know, companies thinking of their employees as chattel or indentured servants. That is not going to work anymore. And People are just going to say, yeah, no, spyware on my company issued computer or phone. Yeah, fuck you. I'm going to go do something else. And this is concurrent with the ability that everything's much more mobile. Capital's more mobile. People are more mobile. People can work from anywhere. And so we're essentially in that vertical, searching out those great ideas that we want to find and fund. So up till now, so you've been doing this for a while. So you, you kind of got the practice of muscle memory of reviewing this. The process up to this point, give us a little light. Was it mostly just like friends and network? You see things come across your plate. You say, okay, this looks interesting. It wasn't necessarily like a very intentional outgoing process, or maybe it was. Because this sort of like not preceded you know, this idea, but it kind of laid the groundwork. Is that a reasonable statement? That's fair. But we had a pretty broad funnel just to, because of who we were. We luckily always punched above our weight in terms of people's awareness of what we were doing. So we started getting pitches for startups quite regularly, well before we even began thinking about, you know, we should diversify into this space. And then, of course, Patrick with Invest Like the Best, the funnel opened even wider and then infinite loops, et cetera. So as far as that goes, the process was loose connections, right? So a friend of a friend of a friend said, hey, you got to check this guy out. who He wants to start a long, short market neutral energy fund. And we would go and then run a process on, you know, what we thought about the potential for the people, for the tech, for the thesis of the company, et cetera. So I would say that we had the added benefit of like thinking like plots, right? So if you're like me, you're always building algorithms in your head, right? Because you're trying to figure stuff out. And You know, it's like, I think it was Wittgenstein who said, don't get freaked out about searching for meaning, look for use. And that's kind of the way my mind works. It's always either trying to figure out, is there a problem? If there is a problem, is there a solution to this problem? And I kind of build it algorithmically in my head. So 
thinking that way is very, very helpful when looking at private market new ideas where we don't have a data stream that is neat that we can interrogate to see whether, you know, buying stocks with the greatest sales gains works or not. But you do have enough what I would call semi reasonable data from your experience pattern of, you know, being alive and doing what I've done for the last 30 years and, you know, kind of saying, well, let's build a heuristic around this, this and this. So that helped us really narrow down the types of companies and people we were interested in working with. And I imagine that, and you can elaborate on this, but I I imagine you had a sort of filter or themes that you may be particularly looking for. And, And I know you just talked to Cliff, which hasn't come out yet, but knowing Cliff, one of the things in his mind is often like looking at a lot like the private opportunities or hedge funds is like, you don't want the beta, right? You want the weird and different, it, particularly if you're going to pay up on the fees. So are there any particular areas that you were drawn to? Or was it more sort of like you're open and just kind of, you know, evaluated each on their own merit and offering or stance? Were you just like, I want to invest in emerging markets or, hey, I'm only a trailer park guy or space investments? Yeah, no, no. We we were more generalist uh, in terms of where we would look. But we wanted to find like, okay, is there something that needs a solution that doesn't have a good one right now? So I think of like uh, Jeremiah Lowen's Prefect, which is basically building uh, much better pipes for all the data that has to flow through companies. And like what was available kind of sucked. And so we did a deep dive and, and looking at what was available and we saw that he was right. There was a huge opportunity. There was a huge need. There was no good solution currently that somebody could just take off the shelf, right? And so we found that to be very attractive and that's going very, very well. Other things like the long short energy fund, Everything was perfect, except we got a clash of people wrong there. And as you know, in a hedge fund, if if people aren't getting along and somebody leaves, that's it. The investor's money is the hottest of the hot money. Just for me, it's generally speaking, am I sufficiently curious about an area that I'll like dive into the rabbit hole and see what I find? And that animates a lot of our investments now and then as well. So looking at sort of the pie chart of infinite adventures, like what sort of percentage do you perceive will be direct company investments as opposed to like funds? Is it meant to be just depending on the opportunity? Is it meant to be 50-50? What's the kind of approach to it? Yeah. So funds will get some attention if we, for example, we just participated in a venture fund called Chaotic Capital. And we did that because we like the operators. They are very different than we are in that they love every single toy on the island of misfit toys. And we think that the most interesting stuff is going to, especially going forward, is going to be in the tails right? It's not going to be in the main body of the distribution. Isn't that always the case, though? Well, as you know, and Mandelbrot proved, at least to my satisfaction, that, you know, markets are not normally distributed. They're chaotically distributed. They're very peaky middles and very long tails. And that's why the math for normal uh, Brownian distributions sometimes really blows up in your face. You know, value at risk being the one that I love to hate on when it was all so popular. You know, so here we're going to give you a single number and that is going to cover every single possibility in terms of what you have at risk. And we all know that that was bullshit. And like when that was really popular back in the beginning of the 21st century, like I think you were in the same boat as me, just like, uh, people, you're you're absolutely wrong but because you're not taking into account these really long, flat tails. And so, you know, that's kind of another thing that we're doing at O'Shaughnessy or Infinite Adventures. 
And so is the process formalized now? Like, so listeners are like, all right, Jim, I got an amazing fund or pitch for you. Like, how do you guys handle what I assume at this point is going to be an enormous amount of inbounds? Like, do you have a team? Like, how are you going to handle this? Yeah, we do have a team. And most of the funding through Adventures is going to be direct funding to a new company. So we're not going to do too many funds. We're doing funds, as I mentioned, like Chaotic Capital for just because we like what they're doing, but also because they're going to find a lot of interesting, deep in the tail type stuff that we're probably not going to be able to find. So again, that gets back to network effect, right? And now that we're in that network, we have access to their knowledge as well. And it can be symbiotic and win-win, right? So if they find something and we follow on, it just makes for a better situation for us. Are we going to look at only, say, tech or only financial? No, we'll, we'll, we'll look at a bunch of stuff. We have a term sheet that we just signed with a couple of brand new founders who are, you know, tech geniuses. And they just came up with a better idea about how you could help boutique retailers get a not only a national reach, but a global reach without having to hire the full staff to do it. So if we see something really interesting, we'll take the meeting. Yeah. You mentioned earlier the ones you looked at. So going forward, is it seed, series A, series B? Like, what's your wheelhouse? What do you want? Our hope for wheelhouse is seed and series A. And, you know, we'd like to lead on the seeds because we can take that people where there's, they have to convince LPs that they're not batshit crazy. We can take those bets and they can't. We don't have an agent principle problem here. And that's very liberating in terms of, you know, our, what we were just talking about, about fiduciary responsibility and everything. But we're also happy to follow, right? So we don't have any pride about being the author of a good idea. No, but by the way, like anyone who says, oh, this is exclusively my idea is smoking something. Because if I'm thinking it and you're thinking it, And you know what? There's a 50 or 100 other clever people thinking it too. And like, rather than not acknowledge that, we embrace that. We love that. Now, there might be 100 smart people thinking about it, but there's 100,000 thinking of all the reasons why it's stupid or dumb or will never work. And, you know, pessimists sound smart and optimists invent the future. And so one of the things that we're looking for is the mindset of like, Oh, we can do that. Yeah. And so that can be across industries. So, you know, if you've got a great idea for, you know, we were talking about before we came on air, wouldn't it be cool for guys like me and you, if we could just press one button for our podcast and everything gets done? (laughs) You know what? That's a great idea. And I'll bet we'll find that company a year or two from now and it will probably I mean, it's getting closer. And, you know, we talked about this before, and this applies to public market stocks too, but it's even more impactful in the private world because you can't sell it even if you wanted to, which I think is probably a benefit. But we often say this is like, this is not a unique insight, but it's like the one insight that matters is investing a lot of these private companies. You have the ability to 10x, 100x, because you're going to be holding them for a long time. And public market investors, really hard to do to hold something for 10 plus years. And and I, the VCs know this, I think, and it ends up being a huge driving force, certainly at, at the seed and, and A stage. All right, well, guys, email Jim with your ideas, not me. Not Jim either. If you've got an idea that you want funding for a company, send it to pitch at osv.llc. And if you are interested in other things we're doing, just send it to info at osv.llc and we will get back to you for sure. We got to save some time for the other three areas because right now we're on Infinite Adventures, uh, which I love, but that's only one leg of the, the table. 
Yeah. So let's move on to the one that's gotten probably the most attention, which is the O'Shaughnessy Fellowships, which are kind of like a hybrid idea between the what Peter Thiel did. But mine actually came more because I'm a somewhat of a nerd and was reading the myth of Atlantis. And I found that one of the things Atlantis did was send out these 12 explorers, right? to see whether there was knowledge elsewhere in the world that they didn't know about and bring it back to Atlantis. And so I thought, ah, I love that idea. Let's do the same, right? I think right now that there is an unbelievable amount of genius in our world. And in the past, geniuses born, live, and died, nobody knew who they were. They didn't probably even know they were a genius, right? They just looked at the world much differently than other people. And now that's disappeared. That Again, this whole time, space, geography collapsing, we can find them and fund them anywhere. And just, I mean, so we opened this fellowship for, we're going to award $12, $100,000 over the course of a year. It'll be paid out over the course of a year. No strings. So they don't have to sign anything with us. They don't have to promise us any IP or do anything like that because we want to demonstrate and, through action, right? Show, don't tell. Show the world that there, A, is an amazing amount of creativity and innovative thinking going on, especially among young people. Young people are getting a bad rap often, which I think is bullshit. If you just look, we opened the fellowships in the first, I think, six or seven days, we had 410 applications. And Meb, we're not talking about like, I want to build, uh, I, I want to think of a new franchise to sell food to people. Although that it might be interesting if it was healthy food. Meanwhile, like whenever we do the poll, which is like, if you could invest in any private company, it's like Chick-fil-A is always like the number one. It's like in and out Burger, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, we used to have Sorry a... Sorry to derail you. With, no, no, uh, it's okay. Like you just make me think of things we used to do. We used to have a joke portfolio that we called uh, Eat, Drink, and Be Merry for Tomorrow You Die. And it was filled up, you know, with gambling stocks, cigarette makers, booze makers, pharmaceuticals. And as you well know, it fucking killed it. It just every year was like... First percentile. Top two French Fama sectors back to 1920, last I checked, were beer and smoke. So tobacco and tobacco and alcohol. There you go. <laughs> but you know, so like here are some of the applications. We got one from a guy who is working on open sourcing quantum computing. And his application came with videos of the seminars that he's run with all of the PhDs in theoretical physics talking about how to do it. Another one is from a South African who wants to research mammal consciousness to see if we can port that over to machine consciousness. Yet another is a, I love this one. It's from a rocket engineer who wants to set up a course to train other rocket engineers so that we have the best rocket engineers in this particular country. Another wants to start the first venture capital fund in Somalia. So literally, we are like, we are just bowled over. Here's another, build 3D human tissue for faster and better medical discovery without invasive procedures on actual living human beings. You can also do that, by the way, with AI, they call it in silico. You build Meb or Jim, you gene map us, and then you recreate us in silico and do all the unspeakable things to our avatar and see what works. But my point is, like, a lot of cynics were like, oh, he's just doing this for deal flow. Well, of course, we're going to invest in some of these things. But a lot of, you know, I'm sure you're going to find, I know you're going to find, there's going to be an artist that gets this grant, who he or she is going to be working on something really cool that is new in art. So this, not all return on investment is money like there is social return on investment and i'm interested in that and so 
I kind of take a, a stoic attitude, which is if I can't affect something by my actions, right? I don't let it bother me, right? It's like, I don't look for things to rail against. I like to look for things to root for as opposed to against. And like right now, yes, of course, we're going to invest in some of these fellows. That's kind of one of the points. But another point is we are going to enjoy some social return from the people that we fund because art is fundamental to good human conditions. So, I mean, look, we say this a lot, but having been in sort of the the startup world for the past almost decade now, like by far the biggest benefit is not to me the actual, you know, funding and money spent, rather it's the optimistic enjoyment and learning process. Like you're talking about space and for a long time, years ago, I was like, wow, what I thought was that space and aerospace was only the domain of these giant companies. All of a sudden, you're seeing all these small startups have a massive amount of success and traction. And it's so much fun to just coattail and learn about all these cool new things, too. So it's fun more than anything. And that's the great watchword here, right? I want to have fun. And to me, having fun is learning new things, meeting new people, meeting really incredible thinkers who think about things in a way I can't even approach. I mean, how cool is it that I get to talk to all these geniuses like all day long and listen to these incredible ideas that they have? So basically what we're looking for, and this applies to everything we're doing, okay? What we want is to be able to make a difference, right? So getting back to... If I can't, through my own actions, affect something, I don't let it bother me, right? That's kind of a stoic attitude. But if I can, then I'm going to try to go all in on it if I can. So, for example, Stability AI, which I invested in, which is an open source AI company. Why? Because I passionately believe that my grandchildren, you know, I have three who are out of the oven, two coming out of the oven very shortly. So I'm going to have five by the summertime. And I don't want my grandchildren growing up in a world that's controlled by a panopticon, which only a few people, big, massive corporations decide what they can and can't use artificial intelligence to do. I think it's a public good that the world should have available to it. That's why I saw an opportunity. Wow, I can, through an investment, per pound on the side of open AI, right? As opposed to closed. And so everything we're doing, we're looking for win-win situations, right? Because the zero-sum thinking really narrows your aperture to a point where you're only hurting yourself, I think. If you like, mine, 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 gimme, 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 you know? And that's crazy. If, if you open your aperture, you're going to realize that there's a ton of, there's more than enough good win-win ideas that everybody can take part in, enjoy, have fun, learn something, gain experience, and at the end of the day, win. You're going to do, you said 12. Is this over like five years? So it's really simple, clean, and easy. It's, we're going to have an annual class of 12 fellows. Oh, wow. And over the course of a year, we're going to pay them $100,000 U.S. to pursue their dream, to dive down that deep rabbit hole, to create that thing that's been just eating at them forever and ever, and life got in the way, right? And so that's it. Each year, there's going to be a new class of fellows. They're going to get $100,000 USD over the course of the next 12 months, and we're going to celebrate and let everybody know both good and bad. You know, here's what this fellow did. Here's what she did. Here's the whole thing. We're going to try to do as much of this as we can in the open, right? By the way, that also goes for everything we're doing. I'm sure that I will fuck up a ton of things on the investing side, and I'll share that because Another thing I want to do is I want to get people to understand mistakes are really good things if they're new mistakes. Old mistakes are bad things, right? If you're making an old mistake that somebody else already made and you could have learned about, then shame on you. 
But if you're making a new mistake, that's a huge learning opportunity. And I put a piece up that I wrote a while back, mistakes were made in Yes By Me. Like this, this idea, right, that younger people especially have, that everyone's like, oh, they don't want to be seen to fail at anything. I don't know a single successful person who does not have some pretty big failure in their past. It's sort of one of the big benefits of being a quant. You and I, we can look to thousands and thousands of failed positions, right, of losers. I wonder how much of that, like, practice of just, and then trend followers, so I'm like double these little tiny cuts. And part of it, of course, is probably age too. But I imagine that it helps us become a little more thick skin. I imagine. I don't know. I think so. And I think that also it's just the this idea that I'm really into Shannon's information theory and what it implies about how we learn. And like embedded in that theory is like, the true information generally comes from being mistaken. And when you understand that, you use it as a learning opportunity and something that upgrades your OS, so to speak. And so rather than to try to not do something because you don't want to be seen to fail, right? I fall down all the time, man. And like, I get back up. That's the important part. And like, oh, I guess I shouldn't jump on that really slippery rock over there. I won't do that again. (laughs) But the point is, if we can normalize, and that's why we're going to do this publicly, right? If we can normalize the idea that we're going to screw things up for sure, and we're going to hopefully learn from those screw ups and then build on that body of knowledge that everyone can avail themselves of. And more importantly, they can also see, well, Oh, look at that. He really screwed the pooch on that one. He's fine. He's doing something new and whatever. So the kind of transparency is really important to us as well. Win, lose, or draw, right? So another thing that we're doing is infinite films. Why am I doing infinite films? I've never made a movie. I have a lot of friends who have made movies and are really good at it, whom I've learned from. Yeah, but I've never done it. Well, one of the reasons I want to do it is because it was always kind of a hobby of mine to write treatments over the years. I've got like 10 sitting around here, one of which a major director said, if you write that as a screenplay, I will option and make that movie. And so I'm going to have fun doing that. Our first thing is going to be a documentary about David Roney, a guy who I had on my podcast, who is like a Rudy times 10. Hollywood doesn't make Rudy anymore. That's the movie about the kid who went to Notre Dame and his determination and persistence finally got him to be able to suit up as a member of the Fighting Irish, right? It's like an inspirational movie. Hollywood doesn't make those anymore. We will. So the first one is going to be about the man who's an amazing human being who I met through Twitter, right? Right. And through an experiment with NFTs, it was really cool the way it unfolded. And that'll be a documentary. But like three years from now, my guess is that Infinite Films will be almost exclusively an artificial intelligence movie company. Yeah, we can just plug in all your books and white papers and say, write a screenplay in in Jim style, Jim 3000, and we'll come up (laughs) in your voice. But the point there is, who are we going to use to make the doc about David, we're going to use young people and we're going to say, show us your work, show us the things that you've done. And by that, we're also making it win-win for them because A, they're going to own a piece of the movie, right? And I'm pretty good at persuading people to do things. So I think I'll be able to sell it to one of the streamers. We're not going for any of the traditional distribution channels. We only are interested in streamers or online, et cetera. But Everybody who works on that movie is going to own a piece of the movie. And if I manage, it's going to be the budget for it's going to be a micro budget. And obviously, we won't make them sleep in alleyways, but it's not they're not going to be at the Four Seasons, right? But the point is, we'll provide all the equipment, we'll provide their travel, their meals, all that. But when you look at the economics, you, the, like the economics of micro cap movies is like ridiculous. The return on investment of those that hit is 
astronomical, but also even if it's just a modest success, it's pretty good too. Right now, Hollywood is still operated like a medieval guild world, right? You can't get your Screen Actor Guild card without being in three movies, right? So it's like, okay, that's interesting. So even if I make a movie with these young people, never do anything with it. Don't distribute it. Don't show it. They still get a credit on their resume having made that movie. How cool would it be to be 25 years old and to be able to be listed as director of Born to Fit Out, the David Roney story? So we want to find a way to accelerate talent. We want to find a way to magnify it, amplify it, and then make them a super note on our network. Is Infinite Media a part of Infinite Films or are these no. separate? separate? Okay, separate. So Infinite Media is, as the name implies, media-driven. I believe that Substacks, podcasts, all sorts of things that aren't even things yet, but in people talking to people, right? We are storytellers to our core. And as quants, that offends us, and it actually gives us our edge, right? <laughs> because I used to give speeches saying, I'm going to tell you about a series of stories about why you shouldn't pay attention to stories when making stock selections. But the fact is, stories are what animate us as a species. And so we're never going to be all full up, so to speak, on the media side. And I think that as things morph, everybody has to have a media strategy and or presence. But one of the things we're doing, for example, Substacks, podcasts, one of the things we're looking at doing in infinite media is both incubating podcasters, Substack writers, uh, but building a family where you can pay them a certain sum of money up front. So it's kind of a win for them. They can continue doing what they love, which is doing a podcast, right? And then we can have an umbrella organization that sells ads for them, that does takes care of, you know, what producer are you going to use? What tech are you going to use, et cetera? But VCs look at, in my opinion, through the kind of Joe Rogan model, right? Where, oh, let's spend $100 million for the biggest podcaster. I think it should be inverted. I think that there are all sorts of incredibly interesting podcasts that are kind of specialty podcasts. I, I think of fishing as an example. I don't fish. I don't know anything about fish, right? Or fishing or anything. But when I look at the numbers, the quant side of me, right? I'm like, holy shit, people love fishing. They love listening to it. They love watching it. They love all this stuff. And you start looking at the underlying metrics on some of these specialty, and it doesn't have to be fishing, be any specialty, like the guy building his house, right? Yeah. The numbers underneath those, and by the way, we it's not going to be just podcasts, it'll be YouTube channels as well. But the numbers suggest that there's a ton of interest in things that you yourself maybe aren't all that interested in. And what do they what do they have that's interesting to someone who's an investor? They have really low churn. Their audiences are growing. They're not going hyperbolic, but they're doing, you know, kind of growing and, and not churning, turning over. That sounds like a bond to me. If you've got like a dozen of those and you can have an umbrella organization that takes all the shit that the podcaster doesn't want to do away, pay them a sum that they're happy with and can live on, you can get a reasonable double digit return on your capital outlay and it's kind of a bond you just you're in you're out are enjoying a bond like return from that particular situation i think it's going to end up being more than a bond like return because you have the potential uncapped upside where you have someone that comes into the fold we did an investment it's an old podcast at this point I got to check in on how it's doing, but it was called Pod Fund, and they had a similar thesis where they were going to invest in a bunch of creators. It was a little weird because it was like an operating company structure. I don't think they could quite figure out the structure. It matters less to you because you guys can design your own structure. But to me, I was like, oh, this is a great idea. I want to be long this till the cows come home. And one of the things we actually tweeted last year, so you're going to have to let me know, Jim, I can help here. 
for my day job. But I said about a year ago, I said, we're going to start doing some digital ads and experimenting in that world because I want to get educated. And look, Google, Facebook, Instagram are great, but I would much rather give those advertising dollars to like some killer creators. And I actually said, yo, I actually said young at one point in one of my, um, we're hiring tweets and just got absolutely ratio gems. So you got to be careful when you say young, because people lost their mind. They're like, you're ageist. You can't, I said young and hungry. And they were like, went crazy about being, I'm, I'm like, Oh my God, are you guys kidding me? You're picking me up on this single word. I go, okay, fine. Let me, let me replace young with, you're not going to get paid much and hungry. And let's see how many, you know, older folks are really going to want to do this job for no money. But anyway, so I was like, I'd much rather this money go to real creators than to the death star of Facebook, where I see my advertisement, and there's 30 comments where you're like, have fun staying poor, idiot, you know, like whatever it is. So when you find these and you start funding them, let us know and we'll sponsor them. So awesome, because you took the words right out of my mouth. I would much rather find the creator, young or old. You know, I'm 62. So I, how can a 62-year-old guy be ageist by saying that young people are clever? Wait till this gets published. You'll get a few. Good shot at you, hey, fucker. You just yeah. only young people. You know, I don't really care about what people think about me. That's another nice thing. It's kind of like, all right, so hate me. But I like that. And I mean, to me, that feels a lot more tangible and interesting and particularly you know, than it just going down Facebook or wherever. So, and kind of think of it as part of the great reshuffle too, right? So complex adaptive systems, man, all emergence comes from the bottom, not from the top for the most part. And so do you have like a structure in place or are you going to kind of just play it by ear on the different ways to work with these new creators? We are going to be flexible because we don't want to box somebody out simply because we had some stupid rule about, you know, you can't do this or can't do that. I'm not a rule guy, as you know, other than in investing. And I like rules that I get to write, <laughs> but I know that that some of those are dumb too. So flexibility is built into our process. So for the listeners who like aren't going to apply, they're not running a fund, they're not a producer, they're not a podcaster, but they just like are curious and let be like, hey, I just want to follow along with with Jim's mission and what he's doing in the next few years. Are you going to be like updating or doing conferences, talking about your podcast? Are you going to let people follow along on what? Matt, people are going to be so tired of fucking hearing from me about this because be everywhere. It's, we're going to be everywhere. We're going to do conferences. We're going to experiment, right? We're going to try a bunch of different stuff, knowing that a lot of it won't work. But as far as the communication of what we're doing, listen, we will be everywhere. And one of the things that we're working on right now, it probably won't come out in 23 because we want it to be really good, is like in this information-saturated age, a place where you can go where you know that the people are good curators of ideas, of podcasts, of substacks, becomes a very valuable landing spot. And so we definitely are going to have that kind of site as well, where you can go and pretty much be guaranteed if you have a particular interest in whatever, that you're going to find really interesting, fresh, different kind of views at that particular thing that have been curated, right? You know, I've been practicing it on Twitter for a long time. Whenever I see something that I really like, I put it up. And what's happened is it it's like anything, right? Nobody notices, nobody notices, nobody notices. And then suddenly I'm getting like DMs from Substack writers who said, you know, I got 100 subscribers when you put up my Substack on Twitter. And so I'm also trying to hire against my own kind of interests. And by that, I mean, people who have interest in things that I'm really like not that interested in, so that we get good curation there. My grandson, Pierce, is running really close for the sports uh, curator. He nice. knows more about sports than any sports guy I've ever known. And he's only nine. 
Well, we got a Ninjago Lego curator with my son when you're ready. He asked the other day, here's a film idea for you. He's like, why do all the movies have a happy ending? He's like, I'm so tired of all these shows. They all have happy endings. I say, okay, well, there's an entire genre. Oh, yeah. Movies that you can watch and then you leave feeling totally angry and dissatisfied because it just ended poorly. I mean, for the longest time, this has got to be like five, six years ago on the podcast space. I say, please, for the love of God, can one of you podcast apps try to allow episode ratings? And they all say no. And the Overcast founder was like, no, people, they don't care about the ratings. They care about discovery. And I'm like, bro, I don't need more podcasts. Like I, I follow at this point, you know, we do this like weekly hu human curation for the top three. Yeah. We track 150 it, just investment podcasts, not even like just general, like the last thing we need is discovery of new shows. I'm like, I want to hear the good episodes from the shows we already follow. And I'm like, why would one of you not even run the experiment and just try this out? I mean, like it's on every other app, in the world, there's ratings. On Uber, there's ratings. On DoorDash, ratings. On Rotten Tomato, ratings. Podcast apps, no. Like, who cares if it's a good show? Like, I have 500 episodes now. Like, where do you even begin? The beginning? Yeah. Like, the like, what's... There's probably 50 that are the best 50, but, like, where are you going to find them? It's, it's impossible. Anyway, rant. I'm at peace with this. I've moved on in my life. For a long time, I was very sore about this. Interestingly enough, we might have a solution for you in a couple of years. A couple of years, Jim. You got to work faster than this, man. Come on. <laughs> you don't have enough going on. Look, yeah, you only have you're four right. verticals. I will get it for you, Mab, by next week. I promise. No, but similar feeling to yours. A rating system, and it can just be like, as you say, you have 500 episodes, right? Wouldn't it be cool if somebody could just pick up an app and say, what are Meb's 10 most popular episodes? And then listen to those. It will happen. We hope to be part of the solution there. Yeah, cool. Well, I think AIs accelerate a lot of these things we're talking about. I haven't even opened my notes of what we were going to talk about today, Jim. Literally, I had like a whole bunch of, we'll do a separate show on investing. But what I do want to save a little bit of time for have we reached the end of the verticals? Do you have like two more hidden verticals you're going to reveal next year on? You're running out of categories. Uh, yeah, no, we probably will have one more vertical, but more in line with that, what I just told you about the curation platform. And that will be fed by the other, by the four. I said Twitter. Chad with Jim, nothing's off minutes. What's the weirdest question I can ask him? I and mean, we're going to have to skip over a few of these because the respondents took this literally, and some of them are just not safe for anything. So we'll do a few. Uh, Shauna wants to know how your Vikings are going to blow it this year in football. <laughs> uniquely, uniquely. It's like a great artist. The Vikings are like great artists in that it has the signature of their particular style, but the painting itself is unique and different. That's what's going to happen with the Vikings. They're going to uniquely fuck it up, and it will be not the same as all the other times that they screwed it up, but that's why you've got to love them. One of the responses to the actual question was, in the most spectacular way. Well, Dan McMurtry was on my show, and he goes, uh, basically, I've come to believe that the outcome of anything is basically the most entertaining one that is conceivable. So I like that response. He's focused on Bangladesh, India? No, he does too. He, he's got a hedge fund, which he's done really, really well with. And he's got this Bangladesh VC that OSB is a limited partner in. Uh, he's killing it down in Bangladesh. Cool. Yeah, I need to coordinate with him offline. All right. Another question. Tom Gardner, from my perspective, Jim's one at life with family and business. He says, do we think of new problems once our family is taken care of and keep the same level of generalized worry about the future? Or does it get better once Maslow's core needs are all fully accounted for? My God, we're wow. waiting for the end, waiting for the end of the podcast to go deep in the paint there. Deep 
Thoughts? I'm glad he asked you because I don't even understand his question. I would have to just be like, all right, I don't know what you're talking about. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the famous pyramid. You know, we want sex and food first. We want shelter and warmth. And then we, if we're lucky, we get all the way up to self-actualization and beyond. So I guess my answer to the question would be it gets better because you do continue to worry about your children and grandchildren. It's just, you can't help it. But if you get wise, one of the definitions of wisdom is knowing what to overlook. And when you are wise in that way, you can overlook a lot of the smaller things that people tie themselves up in knots about. So once the kids have launched and are doing well, I've, an incredibly lucky person. I have fantastic kids, wife, grandchildren. And like, as far as I'm concerned, I've won the cosmic lottery. But yes, tell him, yeah, when the kids launch and uh, are doing well, it does get easier. And you can climb Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for the listeners, I was laughing as we're talking about this, who are listening to this on the podcast and don't have the visual jim is fully turned into a vc now because he's wearing a fleece i think so he's fully evolved into the next version of jim uh the quan into jim the vc <laughs> <laughs> i need to get one of those back patter things then so yeah. I, can back down back. I mean if it if it said netfolio i would be really impressed but i've got netfolio gear around here somewhere man That's awesome. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. Here we go. You want to go full swag? Here we go. Oh, that's cool. There it is, baby. OSV hat. (laughs) I'm too busy. This is from another asset manager. I'm unintentionally out. And by the way, that is class. I will wear other managers' fleeces as well. This is like my favorite little zip. It's uh, listeners, it's Eric Crindon, who's been on the pod many times, who having a great last couple of years with his uh, Managed Futures Fund. All right. There's a couple more. We, you can get, I'll let you get into these on Twitter if you so choose. Notre Dame, things you think are false and others think are true. But we're going to wind down. The question we ask everybody now, I think I may know the answer, but your most memorable investment. And uh, you got thousands to choose from. Good, bad, in between. Wow. Again, as a quant, I think of underlying factors. I don't think about names and things of that nature. I don't, okay, so here you go. Here's my answer. My most enjoyable two investments have been O'Shaughnessy Asset Management and O'Shaughnessy Ventures. Yeah. Well, O'Shaughnessy Ventures is like two months old. Like that, <laughs> you're, you're going to have to reflect on this. In three years, you're going to be like, dude, that was a lot. You got to come, you got to have me back on and I'll be just crying and I'll be cut like, like a, a shadow of my former self and just say, Meb, help me. Which one of your funds should I just put all this dough in? <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's like the famous Pearl Jam lyric in Evolution, except you did it the exact inverse where he was like, I was buying stocks on the day of the crash as you were liquidating your puts the day before the crash. That was the one that I thought you were going to go with. 1987, right? Memorable, actually. But again, that's it's, it's great because it illustrates what we were talking about earlier about mistakes, right? So talk about fucking up. I sold the biggest position of puts I'd ever acquired in my young life the day before the crash, right? And I think I just about broke even on them because everybody and their brother, because the people don't remember many weren't alive, but the day before the crash was a crash in the terms of the times, right? It was down like a hundred points or whatever. And everyone was like, oh, this is it. This is the capitulation, blah, blah, blah. But and I sold the day before what would have been a small fortune, right? On the puts. But what did it teach me? It taught me that emotions will always screw with you at the inflection point. And I was a mostly quant. And after that experience, it was like, you know what? I've learned my lesson. I have to be a quant. I have to ring fence my own emotions or I'm going to fuck everything up just like everyone else. 
I don't think there's been a single time in my entire life where I've been emotionally pulled into a position or a friend has recommended something. And, and I'm friends with like plenty of extremely accomplished discretionary portfolio managers. We'll be riding a chairlift, say, what's, what's your favorite stock now? We'll chat about it. It's like a 90% hit rate that they all just implode. Like either way, long, short, whatever. Like it's like, I don't think it's ever once worked out well for me. So I'm totally done with it. But you know, either that or I'll be like the tiniest position just to avoid the the Bezos regret minimization. So I don't have to hear about it for the next 20 years. But I don't think it's ever worked out for me. Yeah. It's no, astonishing. no, never. Have a process, follow the process. It's boring. But, you know, it's like I was pulling out these notebooks because I'm going to digitize them all and then let the AI explain me to me. But the one that I opened up was one that I did a long time ago. And it was basically talking about why you should pay attention to unique strategies as opposed to just buying the market. By the way, as you know, I'm a big fan of if you just don't want to have anything to do with the market, sure, buy a global index fund and be done with it. And dollar cost average into it, and you'll probably do great. But you know, between September 1929 and August 1947, the S&P 500 was down, real, inflation adjusted, 0.03%, right? So flat. Over the same time period, if you bought simply the stocks with the best six-month relative strength and some cheap factors, you compounded at 5.77. If you bought just the uh, the highest shareholder yield, you compounded at a little under 3.5%. And then a more recent period between March 1964 and February 1982, the S&P, same deal, down a scooch, down 20 basis points compounded, real, inflation adjusted, whereas all stocks where the EBITDA to enterprise value was the best compounded at 13.5% over the same time period, Yeah, annualized. By the way, there's a couple of threads I've had in the past month that people actually, I think we may be at like, we have to be at, at close to the turn for US versus foreign and everything else. Because I've done a couple my largest strategy is U.S. stocks. So listeners, you guys know this, but I had a couple, one where I was like, you know, I heard someone describe their investment strategy. They said they put all their money in the S&P 500 index fund. It's very boring. And I was like, look, I, I don't know what word I would describe, but I would not describe this as boring <laughs> looking at the historical statistics. Like it went nowhere at some point for 20 years, 40 years has an 80% drawdown. Like you can call it a lot of things you can't call it boring. My God, did people lose their mind? And I was like, I didn't say US stocks are bad. I just said, I don't think they're boring. Like what, like, don't you dare call my index not boring. Like what? <laughs> like I was like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life. And then I had one last night where I was like, you know, look, you can actually do perfectly fine taking US stocks off the menu. So you can invest in REITs, Commod uh, real assets, foreign stocks, bonds, global bonds, yada, yada. And you can match with a diversified portfolio of U.S. stocks historically. And again, people are so angry. They're like, you have to know. You have to include them. Anyway, I just remembered that you were mentioning earlier the steel company and business risk. Number one stock in our shareholder yield strategy currently, steel company. Yep. <laughs> so, you got to love it, man. You just got to love it. You got to love it. Jim, I love this. I got to go pee. This has been such a great discussion. It seems like you're living your best life. I'm super stoked for you and the whole Shaughnessy crew and family and friends. Look forward to hopefully crossing a uh, pass on some deals and ideas in the future. Best place to follow you now, the podcast. What's the website for the new venture? It's uh, osvoscarsamvictor.llc. And you'll find almost everything there. Obviously, infiniteloops.com is for the podcast, and I'm always lurking on Twitter, or pretend to be. I schedule a lot of tweets. That's my dirty little secret, so that people think I'm on there much more than I am. <laughs> yeah, I do the same. By the way, have you seen what osv.com is? I have. 
<laughs> it's good, okay it's not yours listeners I'll, I'll, I, i'm not gonna i'll bury the lead you have to go to osv.com find out for yourself no 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 osv.llc don't be a bad boy here meb yeah yeah jim thanks so much uh it was a blessing thanks so much for joining us today thanks for having me meb great to see you